Thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here today. Uh, more than honoured to be here presenting to you today. Uh, as Pierangelo said, I'm the uh, Enterprise Technology Consultant with 3 Ireland. I emphasise the the, nothing and, there is only one. Uh, it's the thing about a made up job title, it tends to be unique um, if it's done right. So uh, what this is all about is a project uh, that we got involved with, uh, known internally as the island. Um, and it was all about connecting, uh, creating a, rather the, the, the most connected island in the world. So I'll welcome you to the island of Iron Moor. Um, it's a small island, seventh largest island uh, off the coast of Ireland. Uh, northwest corner, uh, somebody earlier on, I think she may have left now, men mentioned the northwest uh, of Ireland. This is up off the coast of Donegal, uh, as distinct from the Aran Islands, which are off the coast of Galway. Um, so this is Iron Moor. Um, it is a, a remarkably beautiful place. It's, it's kind of rugged and unspoiled. Uh, has anybody, quick show of hands, been to Ironmore before? Yeah, a couple, couple of visitors. So once you've been, you won't forget it. Uh, it's not the type of place you'd have been and, and not remembered. Um, but many people would go there for uh, Gaeltoc trips in their, in their school days uh, or, you know, summer trips uh, during the summer. Uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous place. Um, there are um, two ferries to get you on and off the island. Um, one is called the Red Ferry and one is called the Blue Ferry. And they're fierce rivals. So if you go out on the red, you better go back in the blue. If you go out in the blue, you better go back in the red. One of them is known, incidentally, as the fast ferry. Uh, but the other one reliably informs me that their ferry is much faster. So it's that kind of politics you're dealing with in an island community. Uh, it's a wonderful place. But that, to date, has been, the, 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 I suppose, the lifeline to and from the island. If the ferry doesn't run, you don't get your stuff on or off the island. You know when your takeaway is coming because you can see it on the ferry. So you order a takeaway from the, from the mainland, from Burtonport, and they put it onto a taxi that goes to the ferry and it comes to That's island life, right, in a nutshell. Um, so we have this thing in, in three uh, where we talk about a better connected life. Um, and I often ask the question to our CEO, is it, is it a better connected life or is it a better connected life? And I was never quite sure what it was, and he kind of gave me a bit of a, well, it's up to you to interpret it whatever way you want it. There's no commas in the sentence. Uh, but the idea is that, for me, it's actually a better life That's because it's more connected. That's the way I would, I would see it. Um, but the idea was, how do we bring that better connected life idea to a place like Iron Moor? And the way we did it was by building what we call the most connected island in the world. Um, so you may have seen the ads on the TV if you've turned on the television or the radio or opened up your Instagram or anything over the last, oh, nine months, you couldn't have missed it. Uh, they fairly much kind of blanketed the, uh, blanketed the coverage everywhere. Um, but the idea was to, to create this, uh, I suppose, a, a, a smart island, if you will, uh, to use to the parlance of today's session. Um, so mine is the only presentation that isn't about smart cities, but it is about a smart island, so it's close. Um, but yeah, we wanted to really make sure that we were trying to make life better on the island. Why did we want to do that? Well, at the moment, there's 469 people live on that island. In 1990 or there or thereabouts, there was about 600. So you can see that the population graph is going entirely in the wrong direction. And for an island of that size to be sustainable, it needs to have people on it living their lives and, and doing what they do on a daily basis. And it's perfectly sustainable with the amount of people that are on it. But if that keeps dwindling the way it's going, that's not what we want to see. Um, there, are three, uh, or there are three schools on the island. There's two primary and one secondary. And you might say to yourself, three primary schools or three schools for, uh, for a population of 469 seems like a lot. But actually, people come from the mainland over on the ferry every day to go to school on the island because the schools are really good. Um, but it's just as well that they do because the population is going in the wrong direction. As you can imagine, from the school's point of view, that makes it difficult. Um, the little chap in his mom's arms there is called Fiuk. And uh, I put him in exactly for the face that you just made down there because uh, it makes that aww face which is brilliant thank you very much right on cue um, but there's a reason to have Fiak in the presentation other than and the fact that his mom is absolutely lovely um, Fiak and Fiona uh, have the the distinct honor or the you know dubious honor of being the last child born on the island and that photograph was taken at least a year ago so Fiak's about a year and a half old now um, that's not a great population metric for any island as anybody who's a social studies or sociologists in the room would, would tell you. Um, so Fiuk was the last one born there. So the idea was to try and get people to move back to the island, to live their lives there, and crucially have their children there and bring their children up on the island. Um, this man here is called Jerry Early. Anybody who's been to the island ever will know Jerry. If you haven't, if you haven't met Jerry when you were on the island, 
you need to go back and do it all again because you missed something, right? So Jerry is, he's a fisherman, as you can tell from this picture. Uh, he also runs the local bar, Early's Bar, one of them. Uh, and he runs the hostel. And for about 25 or 30 years, he was a lifeboat man. Um, so this is typical of island life. And this is not unusual that everybody on the island has about 20 different jobs. You'll go from one place to the next to the next, and you'll see the same character appearing. Um, and the reason is because there's nobody else to do the jobs. So you, you got to do it. If you want it done, you got it done. And that's, a, that's another aspect of, of what's crucial about island life. But they really wanted to be able to continue that life in the way that they lead it. So in about October 2018, uh, the project I started involved with the project about uh, August, September of 2018, when my boss leaned across the table to me and said, hey, Stephen, would you fancy connecting an entire island? And I went, that sounds deadly. Because right, my job on a day-to-day -day basis is working with enterprises around the country. Small, large, so everything from Glanbia to um, uh, McCabe's pharmacies to Unifar to you name it, McDonald's restaurants. And we connect up their stores and we you know, uh, do mobility solutions for them and all sorts of things, which is all brilliant, right? Um, but when we work with companies, uh, we don't get to see the people that that affects. So if I make a pharmacy work more efficiently, I kind of know in the back of my mind, yeah, that customer who comes in tomorrow is going to get a better experience, but I never meet them. Whereas what we did on the island, we were actually going to meet the people individually and, and, and actually have a real impact on people's lives. So in 2018, we went up to do our, our little recce on the island. We wanted to meet the folks there um, and we had to get to know the place. So what you're seeing on the left hand side of the screen there is the original. Um, so we were going to go up and build a digital hub on the island. So you all work in, in places like this you know, shiny, bright, modern, digital kind of workspaces. We are going to have to build a digital hub here. So on the left-hand side of the screen there, you'll see, um, I think these were for maybe like, a, I don't know, pool cues or something or whatever it was. And this was the old pool room. And on the right-hand side of the screen there, that was the original ticket office for the ferry. Um, this was both, uh, these are both in a, uh, the sort of one side of a B&B &B that's on the island um, uh, called the Ferry Boat B&B. Um, so this is what we kind of started with, and this always feels to me like one of those uh, room to improve type uh, before and after shots. So it was kind of deliberately done like that, but that's literally what we found. So we got to know the space and we got to know the people. So that's Jerry. Do you remember Jerry from the fishing shot earlier on? That's the same guy. Um, Jerry's a great raconteur, guitarist, musician, great fun to be around. We had a couple of great sessions with him. Um, I'd been doing this kind of corporate stuff all day and we'd been having meetings and we'd been going forward and we'd been doing all the stuff you do in corporates. And uh, we sat down in the bar that evening and I, he grabbed the guitar out and then he said, will you give us a song? And I said, sure. And I belted out Ordinary Man. And he just went, I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> so we great crack, really good night. You could call what we did full cultural immersion. Um, I'm a sea swimmer uh, as part of what I do. And uh, so I insisted every time I went up to the island that I would go for a swim. And I can report that the water around Ironmore in uh, September, October, freezing. <laughs> really, 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 really cold, but lovely uh, and quite, uh, quite enlivening. But when we did that initial recce, we found so many use cases on the island. Believe it or not, in a place with 469 people, there's so much going on. So it is like a small city, exactly like you see in any urban center. You've got schools, you've got doctors, you've got health centers, you've got nurses, you've got uh, people going to work every day, you've got uh, the post office, you've got a, you know, um, hotels and guest houses on the island, you've got bars, you've got a ferry that takes people across, you've got people going fishing, all these different activities and, and industries that are happening there. So what we, st what we started to see was there's lots of places we can help here and there's lots of places that connectivity can help to bring changes to, to the folks on the island. So we set about a transformation that was going to take about sort of three or four months. Um, we started, so that's a different view of the same room that I showed you earlier on, uh, where the light is actually coming in, so it doesn't look quite as dingy. But this was a pool hall. For those of you uh, under 35, which is most of the audience, this is a fax machine. You may not have ever seen one of those before. Uh, so we used to use those back in the Stone Age. They're great things. Um, glad that technology is gone. So yeah, we started about uh, kind of transforming this room uh, and this uh, dingy old uh, ticket uh, station into using, I suppose, local tradespeople, our own teams of designers, uh, technical people, um, interior folks. And we set about creating this workspace that now is up and running and is known as Modam or the Digital Hub. And Modam is a 13-seater, state-of-the-art 
digital hub where people can come and work. We put in high-speed broadband into it, so we used a, a technology called a wireless lease line, which is basically a microwave and a dish that sits on the top of the roof, looks like a sky dish, and that beams back across to the mainland. And that gives 100 meg uh, connection back and forth. We can scale that up if they need it, but to be honest with you, for 13 people, 100 meg is loads. Um, they wanted a gig, they kept saying, oh, we need a gig, we need a gig. Everybody has a gig nowadays, can we have fibre? And we're like, this is just as good, take my word for it. And afterwards they're like, this is way better than fibre. <laughs> so they're delighted with what we've given them, it's really good. Uh, and there has been people working there all summer. So this went live in around April, May, and uh, it's been up and running ever since. There's been people working there all summer. There was a lady who uh, was born on the island and has been working and living in Chicago for the last, I don't know, 40 years as a lawyer. Uh, she came back for the summer uh, and would usually come back for two weeks in the summer. She came back and spent a full month on the island this year and plans to spend uh, her full two or three months of summer holidays next year on the island because she can work from the, from the hub uh, and do all her depositions and everything like that over the video conferencing suite that we put in. So if you remember the, the slightly choppy video that we had earlier on, um, what we've put in there is, is full uh, HD uh, web conferencing on a screen that's you know half the size of the wall um, so it's pretty immersive that's a that's actually a not a screenshot that's a live video call that I did from there back to the office uh, in a, the subtle bit of branding in, in behind my colleague's head there uh, that's our that's our room called the CX room and uh, uh, my boss my boss's boss in fact said to me Stephen there isn't enough branding in this room so we fix it that three is about eight feet tall um, but we didn't stop with the hub we wanted to connect the entire island so we put uh, a unit outside the local primary school called a, a Broadband Plus. Um, so that's an, ex an outdoor antenna that picks up the 4G signal and then rebroadcasts it indoors uh, as, a, as a Wi-Fi signal. That can be changed over to 5G in the future by just unscrewing the white bit at the top and screwing back on a 5G antenna instead. Uh, and that was able to create for us. So Anya, the primary school teacher, now has a connected classroom. So she can run live interactive services within the class, like all of our kind of kids nowadays are used to um, she was, was having to download clips onto her laptop from home and then bring, now she can actually do it live um, we also then connected up other places on the island like uh, the local health center um, the uh, lifeboat center uh, the local community center so everywhere we could find a place where people were gathering we were, we were putting the connectivity in and we wanted to tell the story uh, so we brought a full camera crew up to the island um, a, a documentary maker. So this guy here uh, was the director on the first shoot. Um, he had just come from uh, uh, about a year filming in Gaza. Uh, so we kind of went Gaza or um, Gaza or Arnmore, which is the more rugged location. <laughs> uh, he said Gaza was slightly more challenging. Um, but so the the point was, it's a it's a person who knows what they're doing in terms of telling a story. Um, we got a different director for the second one, but he had exactly the same ideas. He was brilliant. Um, but the idea was it wasn't just telling our story. So this was, let's make no mistake about it, this was a marketing-driven effort by three to say, how do we showcase the products that we sell into the market in a really un unusual and engaging way? But we wanted to do it by not telling the story about us, but telling the story about these people. Because when you tell a story to people out there in the market, they couldn't give a crap whether it's Vodafone or Air or Three or Gomo or whoever you have yourself. Because for a lot of uh, the untrained consumers out there, they're all the same. Whereas all we wanted to do was, was make it slightly different. So we wanted to tell the story of Kevin Quinn, uh, the local GP. Um, we wanted to tell the story of Jerry, and we wanted to tell the story of Anya. And we filmed all of them and, and told lots of information about them. So uh, this was the phase one video. You may have seen it before. Uh, you won't have seen this version because this is slightly longer than the one that would have been on the TV. Um, but this will give you a sense of, of what happened in phase one. Big sales. I hear an hour and more uh, is the sound of children. It, it's only when you don't have it, sales is deafening. There's no better place to live than hour and more, but we have been decimated by immigration. We're working to make this the most connected island in the world. I don't think we're putting too fine a point on it when we say that this connection is the electrification of the 21st century. With the speed we're going in here, it's <laughs> just as easily as you could in Dublin or New York or London. Being able to work an hour and more means families can live here. 
and that's a uh, game changer. When you can see, you know, 20 children coming in here who are all national school age, they're the future. And that young bunch of children might never have to leave. This project could actually be the saving of the end. This is about people and about making a difference. So that was our first, uh, our, I suppose, our first wrap up of, of the first piece of work that we did, um, and we we kind of wanted to continue the uh, we wanted to continue the effort. So this is a long term engagement. Uh, island communities and rural communities in general around the country have been burned a little bit by corporates like us who've come in and kind of done a bit and then buggered off once they've done the once we've done the filming and kind of you know we leave them. Thanks very much. See you. We've got all our shots now. See you. See you never. We didn't want to do that. We wanted this to be a long-term engagement. So this will run for at least two years. Um, all of the technology that we put in there, we funded up front, uh, and we'll fund for them for at least two years, and then they'll pay for it from beyond then. But by then, we hope that they're kind of up and running and, and doing what they need to do. Um, phase two completed. Uh, the most recent ad campaign you've seen on, you'll see on the TV at the moment uh, is around what we call phase two, and, and that was really taking that network that we brought to the island first and layering solutions on top of it. So what we wanted to make sure we did was um, start to bring that into people's daily lives. So um, for example, we built a, a weather station on the island. Um, so this is one part of it. Uh, but that weather station measures you know, temperature, humidity, wind speed, all that kind of stuff. The only weather station is 100 kilometers that way and 100 kilometers that way. Uh, at the moment, and the one we've put on there now is feeding data back to Med Air uh, in real time. So for the recent storm that happened, I can't remember the name of it, um, that was feeding data back live uh, from that storm, which is pretty cool. And we're just glad it didn't blow away. We obviously screwed it down well enough. Um, but we also put in uh, care solutions for the elderly. So uh, into Peggy's house, so it's not Peggy, but on the left-hand side there uh, in the middle is Peggy's house, uh, where we plugged in a special sensor into her toaster. Uh, and the reason we, we were going to put it on our kettle, because it seemed like the most logical thing to do, but Peggy told us, no, don't put it on the kettle, because I only have 300 mils of tea a day, because that's what the doctor tells me I'm allowed to have. So I only have one cup. So that wouldn't be much use to you for a baseline. Put it on the toaster instead, and we're like, you're a genius. So we put it on the toaster instead, so there you go. That's the kind of real world stuff that IoT, by the way, brings into the world. Um, on the right hand side here, and we also put, we'd, uh, in Peggy's house, we did a couple of things. One was the toaster, one was a movement sensor in our kitchen to make sure that we could see movement uh, happening all the time. And the last one was a, a water flow sensor in her main water pipe. Um, so every time the water flows in her house, that'll send out a signal as well. So the idea there is that these things build up a pattern of behavior. And you start to see, not see, but the, the, the system starts to baseline that Peggy does this, 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 and this during the day. And once, some, once you've got a baseline, then you can start to alert. So if Peggy doesn't make her toast between 9 and 10 in the morning, then possibly something's wrong and a, a message will go to the local um, public health nurse who will then go and do a visit to her. Uh, and the other thing we did then was a, um, a smart boy solution for the fisherman so that when the, uh, when the fishing boy gets dragged out of position <coughs> by a wave or a larger boat, uh, it'll alert its position and say where it is. Um, so lots of stuff happening in phase two. Um, and this is the little video that, that talks about that. For a long time, I did think that we were going to be a generation that was going to turn off the lights. Now, I'm much more happy. In the last six months, I think there's really good energy, honestly. Really good energy. We're here on Aramore, making it the most connected island in the world. This time we're focusing on fisheries, healthcare, and the environment. We pride ourselves on the environment and how clear our water is. This is my office. I have to have that connectivity when you're out at sea. You can see the potential in it. You can see the future in it. We have a very large aging population out on the island, and unfortunately many of those older people are living on their own. Everybody wants to remain in their own home. So any positive initiative that helps the older person to remain independent and to feel secure and safe is always to be welcomed. Those sensors are going to allow us to monitor patterns of behaviour and that will allow us to alert automatically if we detect something that's out of the normal. It certainly gives peace of mind to relatives that don't live here. Mm. We don't have to constantly think, is my mum all right? Is my yeah. dad okay? Like fishing, you know, we're in existence here and there. It's ingrained into our DNA. This boy, it's a bit different to what you're used to. So that's going to use the, the network that we put out as far as the island okay. to send data back so that you'll know at all times where that boy is. 
it's imperative for us to survive that we use every tool that's offered to us. We're working to make this the most connected island in the world. Okay, so I suppose I was asked originally when I did this presentation for the first time, what are your key lessons kind of from the time you spent up there? Uh, the first thing that I'd say is we always, you know, whenever we, I suppose, engage with any company and we treat the, the island like any other company, um, we would always try and listen first. So where are you at right now? What's going on with your business, your community, whatever it might be? Tell us those things because we understand the technology. and. We as technologists need to resist the urge to tell people about that first because, you know, they need to tell us where they're at first. Uh, so listen first and design second was crucial. Um, the last line in the video of it's about people and about making a difference wasn't a scripted line. Nothing that you hear in that video is scripted. It was all done off the cuff. Um, and the reason it was done off the cuff specifically and deliberately was we wanted it to be as real as it possibly could be. So everybody was asked their opinion, what they thought of things, and they said it from the heart. And that line about it's all about people about making a difference was literally what I felt at the time when, when they asked me the question. Um, and it is. And we t somebody mentioned it earlier on. I can't remember who, which presenter. Somebody said it. Uh, it's all about the people. So the technology is just an enabler. Uh, the people are, are, are what's crucial. Um, and the final thing was that we were to be there as a helper, not as a savior. And we kind of took that as a mantra for our time up there. We wanted to make sure that we respected, number one, the physicals of the islands. We didn't want to make it look any different. Um, Las Vegas and the Hills of Donegal is a great song, but we weren't going to do anything like that that made anything look kind of tasteless. Um, but also that we respected the people that were up there and we met them where they were. So we spent evenings up there doing community engagement where we did nothing but just sit and chat and have cups of tea with people and learn all about what they were, were doing. Um, and the idea was that we weren't coming in on the white horse to save them because they don't need saving. That's a terribly patronizing way to look at things. We're just there to help and do whatever we can to give them a hand. So that's the story of the island. Uh, the next time you see the ad on the TV, you can, uh, you can uh, have a little think about uh, what that means. But uh, for today, thank you very much.